Welcome to the podcast and today's guest is Phil Lowry. Phil, welcome mate. Hello Dom, how are you? Yeah, good thanks. So you're in Paris, or you are a bit loud, so just, um, I might have to turn you down a little bit. You're in Paris. Yeah, um, I'm, in, I'm in Paris. Old, old what are you up to there first? Yeah, first of all, tell us a bit about what you're up to there and then we'll get into it. Um, yeah, so I work um, I work around the world in, in the craft beer scene. Um, which has its charms, has its challenges. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, just working this weekend. I was in I was in Germany Saturday, so was Sunday, Monday, uh, back to the UK for twenty four hours, and then yeah, just uh, just landed up in Paris this evening. So then nice. here for a couple of days and a bit of work, and then back to the UK, and then off somewhere else next week. So it's quite good fun. Oh, wow, busy boy. And um, mm. I suppose with all the restrictions lifted and everything, now it makes it a bit easier to get about. Yeah, I mean, on that note, I mean, I, we, uh, I'm sure many have had uh, challenges over COVID, but I, in some respects, COVID, when it hit, was a um, a bit of a blessing in disguise for the first period. It did slow me down. It put my brakes on a bit. Um, I mean, my worst year, best year, call it what you will, was 150 mm-hmm. flights. Um, so that's an inner plane every other, pretty much every other day. Um <laughs> It's not great for the uh, environment, I will admit. Um, I'm definitely trying to change that way. Um, but, yeah, it, you know, there was a period there that it just got a little bit hectic. Um, obviously, fishing wasn't part of uh, part of the agenda then. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's nice being – I mean, it's, I could be doing something a lot different. I mean, craft beer industry, you know, it, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I'm super grateful for how big it's got over the few years, and yeah. uh, it's super exciting, so – Oh, nice. Um, I love a craft beer, uh, especially this time of year. There's a few sort of nice, there's a lot of pop-up bars um, appearing now, which is good to see. A lot of yeah, uh, it's brewers. pretty much it. I mean, everyone, if, if, if you, I mean, whether or not you're in the West Country, Central London, whatever, um, there's decent craft beer around you now. Um, it's just strange how, I mean, there's a couple of lads who I knock around with who are craft beer aficionados. Um, there's a chap called Porridge who's got a craft beer bar up in um, sort of Cheshire way that way. Uh, hardcore carp angler and funny enough. But there's very few um, crossover. Um, you know, you don't tend to bump in. You, don't, you go to a craft beer festival, you don't see people in Fox or Corder where it's, it's, no, it doesn't happen. Yeah. There's, there's no, there's definitely church and state very separate. It, it, it's It's... Um, there's a few in, in Belgium. The, the Bel- when I'm fishing in Belgium, there's a few of the lads there know their way around, you know. But they've got a, a much, you know, they've got a really interesting legacy beer scene over there. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's it's weird how that the two don't mix. Um, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose um, it's more lager on the bank, lager and cider, isn't it? <laughs> or, or red wine for me, but yeah. Oh, no, well, red wine. I put myself <laughs> off that one Christmas many many moons ago. Never again. That's another story, but. Um, right, the reason you're on, well, one of the reasons you're on, so obviously you've just recently released your first, is it your first book, I assume? Yeah, it's, a, it's um, yeah, first, um, first I'd go at putting, you know, stringing some words together and shoving it in print, so. Yeah, nice. So give us um, a little bit of background about the book, the book, why you decided to do it, and a little bit, you know, without sort of going into too much depth about, like, you know, what's in there, but just give people a bit of a tease on where they can get it. I mean, I, where to start? Lockdown, I think, is is for a lot of us. You know, you don't, I did um, I did a course with the Institute of Fisheries Management, um, yeah. as you do, and I thought well, I might as well learn something while I'm sitting around my backside looking at Zoom calls and team calls. So I did that. That was good fun. And then um, messing around. Uh, no, what ha- my mum came round um, the house and she brought this big trunk of old slides from my dad. Right. My dad's an amazing photographer. Um, yeah. And she bought me some of his old Kodachrome um, slides, some Super 8s yeah. and things like, can you do something with these? Um, and from the, on the back of that, I was like, oh, I haven't got a scanner. I used to have a scanner by way back when, and I, I got rid of it as we did with digital photography. And yeah. I thought, I oh, sod this, I'll just get myself a, uh, there must be a newer version. There must be better quality ones nowadays. Um, and then, yeah, I just bought one off eBay as you do and started messing around. And I you know, mom wanted to get my dad's, you know, to reinvigorate him, he's he's not very well. And um, um, right. on the back of that, these killer slides of Turkey and what have you, and you know, massive road trips that 
um, I sort of kind of follow in the footsteps of as daft, daft, let's drive to Italy next week sort of job. And um, <laughs> um, the, of course, I started, um, you know, got through that and I thought, oh, great, I'll have a look around and see what else I can find. And I started picking up uh, my old film cameras and then started processing some film at home, started scanning those. And oh, this is quite cool. I, you know, something to do. I could, a bit of chemistry, a bit of process stuff. It's, it's, it's like brewing. It's what I've done all my life. And um, long story short, getting divorced um, and then started clearing out stuff in the loft, changing some light bulbs up there, and then found a trunk of slides up there from the days on Conningbrook. Right. And just with that new light bulb, um, how I started looking, you know, you know everyone goes up in the loft and they've got spider webs in their ears and, and God knows what else, and a bit of fiberglass, and, and I'm sitting there perched on an old cardboard box, um, open these little plastic trays of, you know, there's Steve Alcott, there's Terry Hearn, and people like that. Um, and, you know, but it's not just those guys, but it was all the local guys. And then the sad part was some of these guys are not with us anymore. Yeah. And just, Paul, that, can I just cut in? Can you put your, if you're on your hotspot, can you just nudge it closer to the window or something like that? Because it's going a bit jittery again, mate. Two seconds. I'll do that. Sorry. Um, yeah. Is that working? Is that yeah, better? Yeah, and then yeah, just um, turn your gain. Can you turn your gain down a little bit on your mic as well or not? I uh, can't do any um, adjustments is it, on. Is it a headset or not? Or... Hmm? It's yeah, it's a is wired it... headset. It's a wired headset. Yeah. You don't just move the mic away from your mouth a bit. That's right. Oh, okay, there we go. Is that better? Yeah, that's it. There you go. Um, yeah, so running back into that quickly, so it gives you a break point. Um, yeah, I was looking, I was sitting up on, you know, as you do in a, a busted cardboard box in, in the loft and picking these slides out, you know, seeing photographs of Steve Alcott, Terry Hearn, yada, 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 you know, the great and the good. Um, yeah. and, but there was also old friends of mine in there, people I'd grown up with, um, people who are not with us anymore. And I started posting some of those photographs on, um, I also went downstairs, started scanning them because you want to see them on a bigger screen, you know, you see the different resolution and, and you know, you say it's only so much good you can see on a 35 mil slide. And just yeah. in that process, there's this Facebook group called old school car pangling, I think it is. Um, and there's a lot of old faces and I've, I've reconnected on there with, um, some of the old guard from, from those days and started posting some of the photographs on there. Um, and people were like, oh, my God, oh, my God, what else have you got? And I started rummaging around, rummaging around. And there was bits in there from Cassian and some up um, the Tong Valley and what have you. Um, and it was, I just realized how many photographs I'd had, I'd got there um, that had not seen the light of day. Uh, I had a tentative um, experience with working for um, one of the old fishing mags way back when I, I really wanted to work in print and, and journalism when I was a kid. Um, and, you know, I, I'd obviously put a lot of effort into some of these photographs. Um, and it was quite, it was almost, it, I didn't, it wasn't, an, it wasn't a romantic trip down memory lane. These were nice, clear photographs of a, of a moment in time there. Um, and then just be the, the, the sharing of these photographs with, um, you know, let's say like-minded individuals, it just blew up my messenger friends from distant past nagging me for prints and things like this. Hmm. And so I just thought, oh, sorry, I've got, I'm sitting here looking at the software of, you know, in design and Photoshop and things like that. Um, I'm sitting on my ass like we all were with lot in lockdown. Um, so I just went, fuck it. Let's, let's put it into some sort of book shape format and see how far I go. Um, started chewing away with that, you know, 25 pages, 35 pages. And it just so, just so happened as, um, getting back into the film photography, uh, I bumped into some of some people, uh, I went and did a dark room course and there's a couple of lads on that who are really, I mean, good, good, good quality, good value young lads who are mad into the scene. Um, and there's a big revival movement of analog photography and they, yeah. they were starting to show me these things called zines. Um, and they're little a five booklets, um, very shiny paper, brilliant, brilliant street photography. A lot of these lads. Um, and that I, I suddenly tried to sort of, I thought, well, maybe if I just merged the two and then 35 pages became 50 pages and I found another box of slides 
and then I'd process another box of slides, process another box of slides, another box. And I just, this catalog of, of imagery started, I was like, oh. and it got to the point where I was like, okay, that's not going to make the cut. That's not quite good enough. And then I, and then my mum came around with another trunk of, of but negatives. Um, and some of them were stuck together. Some were, you know, less than good uh, in state of play. And they're just, just slowly, slowly, slowly working through the, this backlog, let's say, of images. Um, and I got, yeah, I got up to 100 and something pages. Um, and it's worth mentioning, there's, um, there's four guys. I'm it's two guys who, who have been my fishing buddy, John Pack, who's you know, an ex-British record holder, um, fantastic angler, fantastic. He's, we've been mates since the late teens. Um, we both probably, he's, I think he's just turned 50. I'm sort of mid-40s. And we've we've never really fished together very much, but we've always been very close uh, as mates. Um, and another chap called Lee Randall, um, exceptional exceptional angler. Um, and those two, are, you know, Lee lives lives Lee lives n- nearby me in Dover. Uh, John's in Ashford, um, but they've been kicking my backside to go fishing and do a get out a bit more. Um, working life, as I, I described earlier, it, it does a, it does take a lot of time out of my my life. Um, but those guys, one for the fishing, um, but then there's four other chaps that I knock around with, Ray, a mate from university, um, who's still still in contact uh, daily, you know, silly WhatsApp groups, and Trevor, another lad from Coninbrook. Um, and they, I showed them some early, I showed both of those guys um, some early, you know, you can share a link to, to people mm-hmm. of some of the early drafts. And they were like, oh my God, that's Pucker, brilliant, 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 whatever. And I was like, oh, okay whatever i'm not a great one for compliments and um and they said oh that's cool and then i showed it to a couple of lads i know f- still from Coninbrook days and they're like oh mate you've got to get that printed and i was like oh, okay mm, sure and then they i said well what do you reckon I, i'll do 100 copies and they were like phil do you realize what you've made there and i'm no and they so john pack he's very much into his um collectible books uh, and he said like right. mate just put it out there and see how far you go. And bless him, Gaz Fairham um, picked up on it as well. And then a, a lot of the old guard picked up on the, the link and stuff I put out there. And it just went ape shit. I'm not being funny. Um, I was sitting there watching my phone going, bing, 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 bing. And I was just, um, it was a little bit of like, oh, crap. Because it's just, I knew it was going to be more work. Um, so um, I got, I think I got, 170 copies in 48 hours sold which i mean i'll be funny i'm not i've not caught big carp i've not caught i'm not i'm not in the mags i'm not you know even from your low-end superstars in carp fishing um i don't qualify in the, in those realms um and just just to see that many people wanting it i i was blown away flabbergasted and then seeing some of the names on there it was you know people that dare I say it, you and I would have read articles from way back when, uh, innovative, contemporary, forward-thinking guys from the 80s and 90s. And just seeing that, so I thought, okay, great, I'll print a few. Um, so I, I just I rang John up and went, mate, do you realise what's happened here? And he's like, well done, cool. Well, go, go and print 500 copies. What? You sure? He went, yeah, don't worry, you'll sell them. Um, and then, yeah, I think I'm, I've got pretty much, I've got, I think I've got 50 left. Um, and That's it's brilliant. just, um, it's, um, I had to take a couple of days off. Um, yeah. I sat there, I used to run, I used to run a very large, um, beer, uh, retail e-commerce. I was 10 years of that. Um, and Christmas time was horrific when we used to pack hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of boxes of beer a day. And I had, I had flashbacks to those areas as I sort of had all this packaging materials <laughs> stacked up in the kitchen yeah. and, um, yeah, sticky labels and then sort of laser print on the kitchen table and running packing slips off and making sure those that ordered two copies and then, you know, bless them. Some people popped up and were ordering five copies. One guy ordered 10 copies. Um, oh, wow. um you know, of course that's going to end up on eBay in five or 10 years time, isn't it? Or something like that, yeah. but fair play. Um, it's, uh, have you got plans for another print run? Not, no. No, no, no. I mean, no. I mean, the, the only thing that has come from it is that a couple of three guys have asked me to help them do something similar. People who've got, let's say, um, a very interesting portfolio of captures, um, 
and they they've said to me you know i'm in a i'm in a fortunate position you know i went to um i mean my you'll see in the book my nickname student grant um that was lockie uh, martin lock of solar tackle we're sitting on joe's one night at conningbrook and he said oh i'm shit with names what do you do for a living i said oh, actually i'm a student he went well i'm going to call you student grant and everyone, I went, oh no, don't. And of course, that was the, the the young the young man mistaking me, going, don't don't buy. It. And I, of course, I clamped down on that one. And of course, he stuck. And um, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it. Oh, right, student. Um, I've had that for years now. So, um, but I, the consequence of that, or the, is that I, I did go to private school. Um, I did get kicked out of private school. Um, uh, uh, going car fishing too much. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I, um, and then yeah, went to. I've been to about five different universities. I've got a couple of masters, a couple of postgrads. Um, so um, yeah, over, overqualified, so to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I got kicked out of school because I, I basically I grew up in the Colne Valley area, um, yeah. sort of Slough. Um, my grandmother. Well, I'm not British, uh, just for note, and. Um, but I kind of grew up in the Slough, sort of Chalfont, Uxbridge um, right. area. Um, and then basically my my mum had uh, restaurants, uh, Italian restaurants. And being, I sort of left to live with my grandmother, sort of kind of uh, a bit feral. And I started fishing Farlows at Ivor when it was under the William Boyers thing, you know, John Stent and that in the cafe there. And, you know, I used to see Joan in there and, and Briggsy and all that knocking around. It was obviously the crazy days of mailing and... Um, you know, Little Britain Park, Black Park Lakes, I'm sure a lot of people know that area. Um, my dad was a police officer, um, so um, I was able to get into the Mets, obviously the Metropolitan Police Fishing Lakes, which are, you know, the Thorny Weir Fisheries now, um, and, and things like that. A lot of, It was a good time. I mean, it was a great place to be a, a, young, a young person with fishing rods and goofing around on the canals and, and the rivers and the lakes. Um, I can and, imagine that was going to be my next question, is how did it all start? Your first carp. Talk to us a bit about that. First carp. The the only one I I, mean, I I remember catching carp up at Farlow's, but not nothing particularly big. I, it was always a bit serious for me, the bivies and static yeah. and and things like that. I've never and still to this day, I'm not a great one for long stay fishing. Um, yeah. I mean, I had uh, bless him, a, a very good friend of mine. Um, we 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 sort of um, I'll, I'll come round to that one, but. Um, you know, Dean and I, we went to, to France. We went to Fish Gigantica for a week. And that's about the longest trip I've done in, I, got, I can't think the last time I sat in one spot for a week and just fished. It just, that's it's crazy for me. Um, most of my fishing today is very, very short fishing. And we almost like what the Nash boys call ADHD angling. Um, but yeah, where it started um, was certainly on the, you know, up there, fishing on the canal, but certainly more single rod grab and go fishing. Um, but it's only when we, my father retired in the police, we moved to the Romney Marsh in Kent, which if you don't know it, it's a backwater. It's, it's right out in the boonies. Um, and bless, you know, brilliantly, I landed on a, the house backed onto, a, um, uh, what they call dikes, little, almost like Dutch drainage ditches. And they were heaving with carp, absolutely chocker with carp, um, doubles, twenties, a couple of thirties, literally I could throw nice. stones out of my bedroom window into these ditches. Oh, wow. And, um, I still, to this day, I've got, I've got the rod, but I was at, there's a, a fantastic little fishing tackle shop in Hastings, um, called Red Ferns. And, um, it was, there was two tackle shops pretty much, um, in the area that you could actually go and get contemporary kit from. One was new Romney tackle and one was Red Ferns. And I was able to get on the train, go down there get bits and bobs. Uh, cause obviously not in the Carl Valley, too regular anymore so i couldn't go to hairfield tackle shop um and what have you and there was stains angling um i think was another one with rich i think richie used to work in there which was cool as hell um and then um yeah just used to basically grab a bag of dog, dog biscuits or a can of corn a single rod and still got the rod now which is an old 10 foot two pound stalker uh, the old um carbon kevlar's you know cur what are they called sport x's and um yeah, yeah used nice. to walk up and down there as a kid and just pre-bait with a hand crawl of corn or I'd buy a sack of maples. And this is the June the 16th, March 14th era of fishing. Um, so I used to pre-bait and I used to go and maybe do a late night. Never did night fishing on the canal. Never did very much night fishing on, on the ditches. 
um and just yeah just doubles 20s here then everywhere double you know 20 pound common I've, I've got a fantastic photograph of me back in the day there and i look like harry potter with a, a sodding great carp across your chest um it, it's it's mad looking back at what that luxury of that little ditch and then the royal military canal um is that one in the book i'm gonna have a flip through it no 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 it's not in the book it, the, the book's about Coninbrook. um just Brooke, yeah. yeah um and then there's on the 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 beauty of the marsh is that there's at the end of the peninsula uh, dungeon s end lid there's a load of gravel pits uh, brett's and semex or was rmc yeah. um had extracted and part of the kent river board is that they put a load of carp in there um so there was little pits behind the airport that had loads of singles and doubles in and then there was other pits down there that had much larger fish in but it was all a little bit jumpy over fancy um guesting as the yeah. kids say um <laughs> and uh so i did that for a bit um and you know to started to drive um toodle back up the Kong valley a bit um fish savvy on the days um when i could and then yeah just messed around on the marsh um a lot of the so that that era in kent um it was very hard to get into uh, Faversham, you couldn't get into Faversham Angler Club. You couldn't get into Sittingbourne Angling Club. Um, there was a little lake in Ashford called the Working Man's Club Pit that had a massive common in it. Couldn't get in there. Um, right. It was very, very restricted to get into what limited water there was in in the Ashford, Canterbury, Romney Marsh area. There was one called Heartbreak on the Marsh. It was incredible. Um, but then they turned that over to jet skis and things like that. And I think there was a problem with one of the uh, one of the two stroke additives or something like that. And that, um, consequently there was a I think there was a bit of a fish kill. There it was kept, sort of kept under the wraps changes. At, uh, there's a pit, a very famous pit called radar there's changes there. You couldn't get on the place. Uh, it was just very limited fishing down there. Otherwise it was back to the canals and the ditches. Um, and then all of a sudden this club called mid Kent fisheries opened, or oh, it was actually called, um, uh, Char- uh, Chillum angling club at the beginning and then they they had Chillum Lake the very famous lake now um and then all these other gravel pits that um were under the the, the Brett's management the Brett's land Brett's construction which is a large gravel extraction company very much like RMC William Boyers all these old um uh, extraction uh you know companies um and they had done something quite sensible and like the halls scheme they created Midkent Fisheries although they'd sublet it to a group of people. Um, and that included Conybrook. And that's how I ended up in Conybrook, is all of a sudden this big lake that I'd seen as a kid. Um, uh, I went, I mean, you'll see it. In the, it's, and I, yeah, all of a sudden I could go and fish it and I started doing nights on there. Um, how old were you at this point, did you say? I was probably, well, I was driving. I think I'd literally just started driving, so 17, 18, um, when I first started fishing it. Um, and I was only there was only about five or six of us fished it. Uh, back in those days, uh, it was Gooba. I, f- I don't actually, Gary Strover is his name. And there was John, who became known as Nice John, Ian Brown. A lot of people know Brownie, uh, fantastic angler. Um, he's a research scientist. Um, and then uh, Texas Tom was a painter decorator. I think it's Chimney Sweep now. Broke up a little bit then, mate. Can you hear me still? Yeah, I can now. Yeah, just yeah. for literally two seconds. That's what I was just going to yeah. go in case it didn't work. That's all right. Carry on. Yeah, yeah, Texas Tom. And then there was, of course, there was a bit of an old, it was another guard on there of Paul Forward, uh, Phil Lloyd, Darren Lloyd. Um, and then Oz Oz was knocking around a little bit back then, Oz Holness. Um, and it only, I mean, the place was barren. It was literally lake, grassy banks, two houses, a sports stadium um and a river on the other side and it was agricultural fields past the river um fantastic it was proper you know boys own paradise uh but the crazy thing was it only had 16 fish in it (laughs) 16 it was insane um how many acres 20 probably 16 to 20 acres never really sure because it's it's kind of it's rectangular ish but it it was something it was always said between 16 and 20 acres um, it's about 18 foot deep in the deepest bits. Most of it was about 10 and 12 foot deep. Right. Uh, no features. One, I think one sort of bar, which was not really a bar. It was more a roadway when they, um, the extraction, you know, the trucks 
um, left a, a lumpy, bumpy bit, and that was about it. <laughs> Maybe yeah. a there was a couple of spoil heaps in one margin. Um, there was literally no features in the place, just a very large, shallow margin, and that was it, just a hole in the ground with 16 carp in it. Um, just one happened to be very, very big. So, and that's how it all... That's how it all started. That was a, that was an upper thirty, low forty when I first started fishing there. Two time, um, the long common. Of fire then. Sorry, was that a bit of a baptism of fire then for you, going on to there? Not really, because I didn't really have any aspirations. I didn't really. I wasn't. I didn't have a, anything to prove. I didn't have anything. I mean, this is all the thing where you, you know youngsters go, "Oh, that water's too hard for me." Why? You know, so it's only what time and effort you can put into it. If you can put the time or you put the effort in, they're not necessarily in proportion. So you can put a lot of effort in, but you fish short sessions. Or you can put a lot of time in, but you don't have to fish it intensely. It's just up to you what you've got available to yourself. Um, and, you know, in hindsight, watching people like Jan Venska, the way he fished uh, was incredible. Um, he was day only. He used to drive all the way from Surrey and fished off the barra, just walk around, walk around, walk around, walk around. Lee Watson, likewise, another incredible angler. Um Again, highly mobile, highly agile fishing. Um, just constantly, constantly looking, looking, looking. Um, and they caught them and they're very short session angling. Um, so it's not necessarily, I don't believe it's now in hindsight, time applied is necessarily relative to how many you will catch. It's always, a, it, it's it's effort as well as um, yeah, time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, all just um, time spent walking and watching and learning, isn't it? Yep, exactly that. Um, Building up a picture. Exactly. Um, but you had, you know, two tomes in there. You had the long common, which was a mid 30, low 30 at the time. Um, there was a fantastic fish called scaly, which is absolutely belting, belting looking little mirror, but it was always 27 pound. It was never more than four or five ounces in difference. <laughs> um, there was another mirror called Tom's pet, which Texas Tom, he caught it regularly, but it never got caught by anybody else. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, real, real character fish in there. Not necessarily big ones, but just really good yeah. character fish. And then just two times just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, yeah. We we put some other fish in from another. There's there's actually in in hindsight it was one, two, three, four, five lakes were actually originally on the complex, um, but two became part of the bigger lake, the main Conybrook Lake. But it was also another li what we used to call Little Conybrook, and then there was what we called the North Lake. Um, the North Lake was just a hole in the ground. I, I, I put a couple of carp in there years ago, but um, I don't think anything came of them really. But Little Conningbrook had a few carp in it, which actually the fully scaled um, Tesco's fish, uh, the friendlies came from, which were moved over gradually, um, some by my hand, some by others. Um, and the, the stock became very, very interesting in the latter years of uh, when I, I I stopped fishing there in about 2004, and there was some right. quite incredible head of fish in there. Bear in mind, you had a, probably a 60 pound mirror in there, a consistent 40 pound common, mid upper 40 pound mirror, um, and I think there was a couple of three other commons in there approaching mid upper 30s as well. So in the early 2000s, that was a pretty bloody impressive stock of the lake, mm. um, which you know when you looked around the lake. I mean, I, I, a couple of people have taken a piss at me for saying this, but it was it got silly. When you look at who were texting, who you got on your, um, um, your, you look through your phone of who was texting, and it was some, you know, these are people that, being a youngster from, let's say the Con Valley, that corridor, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Malin's early books, um, and these were people that I held in high regard for what they'd achieved, and all of a sudden I'm looking around the lake, and they're like, they're on the same lake as me. What the hell's gone on here? And it was a consequence of this, just the sheer, um, the sheer size of these damn things, and the challenge that was was going on. And you know, I blanked my ass off for. I mean, I caught my first one about three trips in, and then I lost one about two hours later. Um, and then I think I caught one about a year later after that. Um, and then I blanked for about eighteen months after that. Um, and I'm talking eighteen months of um, a couple of nights a week. Um, so, you know, I was trying to juggle university and a bit of fishing yeah. and what have you. Um, I was still working as well. Um, um, 
but the just the fish just kept growing and growing and the popularity of the place and the complexity of the place just you know just grew it was a it was a barren nothing hole to begin with yeah. and then it just became i mean just became better and better but the the, the party scene let's say the, the night the night owls was incredible i, I mean the, just the sheer amount of food wine beer um mm. banter bullshit it was amazing and there's people there that still to this day are some of the funniest people i've ever met in my life uh, mike okay. red mike spug redfern um I'm, I'm sure a lot of people know from the solar mainline um uh, you know stuff in the old mags one of the funniest people uh, you'll ever wish to meet um and some some of the stuff that he got up to is certainly not for uh, pre-watershed conversation uh, it's, it's, yeah it's it's and then this is coming from a bloke who's sitting in a hotel room in the arse end of Paris with a suspicious amount of red neon around him. So yeah. it's... Uh, yeah, he... You can't so, share any of those stories, then? Um, I don't... You know, I, I'm, I'm sure if you picked up um, some of Mike's books, Bugs' books, I'm sure the stories are in there. Um, all, I, all I do know, I, the, one of the scariest ones is just seeing him roll back on his backside with his pants down and just literally holding a lighter to his asshole. And just then, all of a sudden, just the, this the most enormous flame. Um, and I'm just sitting there going, "What the hell have I? What? What? What have I done in the? What have I kept kicked to end up here sitting, looking, looking down the barrel of some other guy's backside with the, the <laughs> largest flame?" <laughs> and then I, I, I think it, I think it left him a little bit singed at the same time. So, yeah, silly sausage. So. <laughs> So when, um, I mean, in terms of the style of angling on there, how did you, did you go about it? Did you sort of stick to a similar approach or were you constantly trying to change? Um, I think in reflection on my, you know, I wasn't the most experienced angler before I went on there. It, mm. I caught I caught a lot of carp, but it wasn't particularly from those sort of types, type of venues. I had to learn quickly as I went along. And, and being frank, doing what I do now, um, I learned a lot watching um, some quite, I wouldn't say aggressive, but talented um, anglers. Really, you know, you put it, it's hard not to fish around pull forward and not learn from him. Um, incredible, incredible angler. I mean, one of the one of the best on fish anglers I've ever seen in my life. Um, and being frank, I did spend a lot of time fishing around Lee Jackson. Um, again took me under his wing somewhat um taught me loads and you know explained very simply just and when you watch anglers of the caliber of lee who's been around the block multiple times mm. you can't but learn from these guys watching mimicking their approach not to not to the sort of i want to copy them but just seeing why they do what they do um you had people like woodsy on there dave woods our very old school essex angler uh, brilliant guy. Um, in a, so my approach was always short session angling. Um, it was quite remarkable how many fish came out on Tootie Fruities on there or Tiger Nuts. And it was a lot of chucking um, yellow pop-ups at fish. For some reason, they loved a yellow pop-up in the spring on there. I don't know why. Still to this day, considering the sheer you know, amount of natural food, I mean, I caught the first those first couple of bites on there on what I would call a low zig nowadays, two or three foot yeah. off the deck with a big right. bunch of worms on the top. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a little 12, 24 mil super buoyant, uh, sorry, 12, 14 mil um, super buoyant pop-up just jammed on the back of a very simple nylon rig, um, probably a size four super specialist looking back, um, and a big bunch of worms. Just little, um, what do you call red worms, branding type things, oh, yeah. uh, just yeah. stitched on the top of the pop up. Because um, I suddenly, I thought the, the thinking I was doing then was there's so much natural food in there. Um, I had to put something in the front of their face that there was going to make them stop or curious or something like that with enough yeah. scent on it that might actually distract them and make them screw up. Because I think you were catching them on there um, in spite of things rather than because you were doing something um mm -hmm. so just the lake was so damn rich it was insane there were snails on there the size of your thumbnail um at the end of your thumb they were that there was so many of those the, the lake would shut off for months on end because you knew there right. was just a, gl a glut of naturals in there <laughs> um and 
but it was mobile fishing because they they loved the wind on there. So you knew if the wind changed, you had to be in front of them on there. And that's what Ian Brown did with casters. There was a lot of use of, of use of naturals on there um, in the early days. Somebody somewhere had won a load of boilies and thrown a shitload of boilies in there, and they all rotted. And it took, kind of gave the place a reputation for the don't eat bait in here. Um, we it's bollocks. It's utter, it's utter tosh. Um, because you know Gary Bay's went on there, you know Cy Bait are big users of of lots of bait, um, and it, it was just it was almost opportunist fishing, sort of sitting sitting stalking for want of a better term, um, and that's how, pretty much how I approach my fishing on there. Just try and find them, try and get the rods out, you know, tiny leads, half ounce, one ounce leads, long hook links, just trying to not scare them and you get you, you if you're lucky you know a handful of casters around the, the end um you, you get an opportunity um so but the thing was that wasn't the way of catching the big one in hindsight the, that that's not how that was great for catching white tips or the long one yeah. or things like that they were much more margin dwelling fish the big one she never really or he or whatever yeah. we, we figured it out to be was yeah. much more of a deep water um you know, always yeah, caught. I was going to the... say that um, it was did, did not have a big reputation for never being caught from the margin. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's one of the things in hindsight that I think that where on my personal angling because I caught the friendly mirror four times, I caught scaly three times, I caught white tips twice. Um, a lot of the fish I caught were re- repeat capture. Sadly, um, I'm not the biggest fan of doing that. To to be serious about myself, um, and. You know, I, 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 when I stopped fishing there, I, I stopped fishing there in 2004. I moved, I moved to California. Um, and the I did, for a few years, have this sort of monkey on my back. I should go back. I should go back and have another go. And I go. And um, obviously, being in California, it wasn't it wasn't a five-minute drive to go and go back there. Um, I did keep in touch lightly with what was going on. But I think the, the, my not catching it was a consequence of that I tended to fish for fish. I could see. I, I was much more as a consequence of growing up fishing on the marsh, fishing for very. I've always been a much more visual angler. I love my fly fishing still to this day. If I'm working in in Yakima, where my our head office is, um, still to this day, I'm fly fishing. I, I love it, and again, it's visual fishing. Um, I've not. I've never been a one for chucking and chancing. Uh, it, it's and so I think that's why I never really caught the big one. Chances I I might have lost it one night, but. Um, who knows? I know Spug lost it. Um, I know a couple of, I think Lee Randall might have lost it. So there are people out there who did a lot of time on the place um, who who lost who lost it at a time. Um, I think even um, uh, Tom Banks didn't catch it as well. Yeah. So, uh, But then you had people like Steve Alcott, didn't fish it very regularly. The lake came in one night, dropped in the same plot. I was, I was vacating because I had to get back home. I said, mate, I've seen it jumping out there. He just rocked in my swim, bashed a lead out to it, to where it was. Um, next thing you know, two o'clock in the morning, I've got a phone call. I've got it. Can you come take some photographs? <laughs> so, um, you know, same, uh, you'll see in the book, there's Terry Glebioska. I was fishing next to him. The weather looked absolutely amazing in the springtime. You'll see in the photographs, there's, you know, you can see the that early spring detritus, you know, that sort of algae pop-up stuff. Yeah, uh, you'll see that in the margin, you know, the behind Terry in the photographs and the foam and stuff like that. It was a beautiful, warm day, and then yeah, he came. He was a yeah, Terry Glebioska, day angler. Never did no overnights. Never did any any long stay fishing. Literally left his house, went to tackle box, picked up some rubber corn, turned up at Conningbrook, flicked it out there. Comes down to me for a cup of tea. I make him a cup of tea. Next thing you know, he's coming back to my swim, going, "Dude, I've got it. Can you come some some photo? Can you come and wait and take some photographs for me?" It's um it's it's, amazing, it's, isn't it? I guess. Yeah. yeah it, it's um, how many times did you see it on the bank, Phil? Uh Lee Watson when he had it, I think he I saw Lee Watson actually last week. First time I've seen him in years and years and years. Um he, he told me it was fifty five, something like that. Um Pet Food when he had it once. Uh I think I saw it. I didn't see it when Mark Smith caught it because that was a bit of an anomaly. He had it at 43. 
And Mark, I think, was only his second or third carp he'd ever caught in his life. Uh, as a local local chap. Um, um, I thought Gary Strover catch it. Uh, obviously, Jim Shelley, uh, Steve Alcott, Terry, QK, Quiet Keith. So, yeah, a good few times. I don't know what that amounts up to, but it was... Mm. I think as I had 60 pound Rubens and I had a big Cotswold Aquarius mat, it was, and I was sort of known as being fairly handy behind the camera. People tended to reach out when, when it came out. So or I was either there or it or was because I only lived 20 minutes away, um, yeah. bomb up the road. And I did actually drive back from, um, Tesco's one day, um, with the handbrake on. I had a, I used to drive this little fantastic little car. I almost looked through eBay to see if I could find another one as a, a V-Dub Polo, little tiny estate V-Dub Polo. Um, yeah. And I drove back from Tesco's with a handbrake on one day to, to go and take some photographs for a guy. Um, and I yeah, nearly destroyed the car, wondering why it wasn't going very fast. Um, there's a reason for that. But um, the it, just, it was just a beast. I mean, I can't tell you. John Pack, obviously I saw it when John Pack had it as a record at 50 something. I forget it was 60. I can't remember it was 64. Maybe I think it was, I can't remember it was. Um, and that was in February. So you can imagine what the colors of the thing looked like. Um, and John Pack and Steve Alcott are not small people. They are six, two, six, three. They're as broad as I am. And they're big, big people. Um, and 60 pound carp are not small. Um, and they literally make these things, you know, look like for mid forties, mid fifties that, um, and seeing, you know, you can see, I think in the book with QK, who's a, <laughs> a normal size person. Um, and you can see how big that was at 63 in front on, you know, and I, I remember Terry Glebioska trying to pick it up and it was a, Oh God, this is heavy. You know, he was a proper, got to get these photographs done quickly because this is heavy. Um, it's just, you know, you just not pick it up. I mean, I, I still regard a 25 pound plus fish as a big fish. Um, you can, you know, I'm sure we've all done it. You, you fold back the, the landing net and you, you go and pick it out and put it onto a mat and you think, well, actually this is, it's got some heft to this. And then yeah. now, you know, now double it and a bit more. Um, it's 60, 63, 65 pound carpet is a big lump of animal and you've got to take care of it. Cause they, it wasn't a young, it wasn't a young fish anyway. Um, and uh, that size, I mean, one of the sad things, I mean, I was talking to Tom, Bank, Tom Banks about it uh, a few years ago. Uh, it was just, you, if you look through the book, you can see how it was. I mean, it's never the prettiest bloody thing in the world, I will admit. Um, it's in proportion, isn't it? Sorry? It's a, it's a well in proportion fish though, isn't it? It's a bit, it was a bit, it was not a an obese thing. It was not one of these no, big, you know. I, I'm sh- yeah. It, 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 um, I was thinking more of, do you remember the, the, when there was that record came out of mid North Hans and then some of those Albert Romp fish that came out of Save wasn't there. Right. There were, um, or sadly the one that was in Wingham, very, uh, you know, uh, very, very spawn boundy. This was just a, it was a big fish. Um, but it did, you could see over the years, its mouth got a little bit, not ratty, but certainly wasn't, I think it, it wasn't as good a shape of the fish as, so the first time I saw it was when, no, it was, yeah, if you look at the photographs where Lee Watson had it, you can see it's in really, really good nick. Um, so, but it was it was so well. I mean, the fish was so well cared for on that lake. It was. I mean, we had Dave the doctor, uh, was a very well known guy, um, and he he we had I think the long common split its uh, tail fin uh, somehow whatever, and he sat there and stitched it back up with dental floss, and mm. and then. You know, a year later, it comes back out again. They cut the dental floss out of it. And it was immaculate. And it's it, because, I mean, I'm sure everyone listening has seen the photograph of um, that long common in Terry Hearn's book. I mean, it, that on its day, that fish looked incredible. Uh, if you yeah. caught it after spawning, it looked a little bit like it had uh, shagged everything in the lake. So it, uh... <laughs> it was incredible. It was in hindsight. I mean, one of the things that book has prompted with his conversation with a lot of old friends of just their memories of the place. And I can imagine. It's, it's, no, I was just saying it's from the crazy, from, you know, one of the regulars on there taking the piss out of another about just 
dribbling after a wee and then all of a sudden turn around and pissed all over the other guy. You know, there was some extreme, extreme stuff went on on there and then right the way found to genuine, you know, warm, familial camaraderie. Um, and I'm sure there's people who've made lifelong friends on the bank of the place. Um, the barbecues, that I mean, that's to this day the social. I mean, still, I still love social angling. Um, mm. And the, the barbecue scene on there, Gary Rochester set the pace on that front. And Spug, uh, sorry, Smudge, who's no longer with us, their abilities with barbecues, they were making pizzas and pies and things like that on barbecues 20 years ago way before Ridge Monkey stuff and all these modern stuff. This was just bodged together, you know, Weber barbecues, and they, they'd come up with three-course dinners off of a barbecue. Um, it was insane. You know, it was often you'd see guys with two barrow trips. One was the fish and tackle, one was the barbecue and the grub and the beer. Yeah. <laughs> Proper angling. <laughs> mm. Well, nothing happened on the – nothing happened. On, everybody sort of, sort of slagged off. If you weren't involved in the place, people got a bit of shit for – you were in off your rods or this sort of stuff. Nothing happened at night. You know, there was guys blanking, you know, month in, month out on there. Nothing happened. You was mm. you chuck your rods out, sit back, and you'd wait for tomorrow. It was all dawn and dawn bites primarily on there. Um yeah. and you, you never had people I mean, I was off my rods one bite for one bite, and it was a day bite. Um but that was out of how many captures I had. Um you know. I don't, there was never, I mean, it was the reason a lot of people, I mean, like the Tesco's fish, one of the members was in Tesco's when his rods went off. <laughs> Tesco's was, <laughs> Tesco's a couple of three miles along the road. Um, these things happen. It wasn't very good angling in hindsight. Um, <laughs> but hey, um, there was, there is a, there are mitigating circumstances to that level of uh, stupidity. But um, yeah. somebody was supposed to be looking after the rods, but got bored and walked off. So, um, so yeah. it's, 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 these yeah. things happen, you know, it's all stories. Yeah, it yeah. sounds a hell of a place and obviously, yeah, reading about it and I'm, I'm keen to get into your book. Um, if people want to get hold of the book, though, with a few remaining copies, what's the best way of doing it, mate? There is on my personal website, um, which is phillowry.net. Um, mm -hmm. You can just grab it off of there and just pay by PayPal. And I'll, as soon as I'm back in the UK, I'll stick it in the post to you. Um, yeah. um, I have limited it to one per person now because I want to make sure it's those that get it, um, or those that want to get it rather than having yeah. to do the sort of secondary market crap. Um, you know, as I said, as I said you know, I've listened to stories and I've heard stories of, of you know, Daryl Peck with his book appearing on eBay at large numbers and it's unnecessary. It, you know, it's, it's, it frustrates me because it's like the the, the gouge, you know, ticket resellers. Yeah. It's, um, the money's not, I mean, I've, I've, I've experienced it in the beer industry, you know, certain limited release bottles of beer finding their way onto the resale market that the actual original brewer doesn't get the value out of it. Um, yeah. so, um, same with the wine market as well, whiskey market, anything that's a limited resource, finite resource, but I'm not yeah. going to, I'm not going to, you know, to placate that by reprinting it, I just don't have the headspace and time. I've got another book I've got to do, which is about beer, yeah. uh, which I actually probably know more about beer than um, I probably let on. Um, mm -hmm. um, so I've got to do that. I've got a bit of a bug for writing these books, and it's you know, it was the, the Coninbrook one was a it was a sort of little bit of a um, preamble, a bit of fun to, to to sort of sharpen the knives a little bit before I go and have to do something properly. Yeah, nice. Mm. Yeah, good for you, mate. So it's like a, a real good lockdown project, it seems. Mm. So, um, any angling plan for the future? Is that I know with work? I, d I did. I'm 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 lucky. One of my best mates, um, um, and I, we kind of we've got a little syndicate we're part of, um, which is a very much a grab and go. Like it's a, it suits my fishing down to the ground. We keep the wet our wet gear on site. Um, you keep the barra there. Brilliant little place for for that. Um, I've got finally. This is the crazy thing. I was I was trying to get. I've been trying to get into Faversham Angling Club for years. Seventeen years on the wait list. I finally got in there a couple of years ago, um, and then I got into DDAPs a few years ago as well. So I've got. Um, they're, they're fantastically well run clubs. Those two um, and really good old legacy lakes as well. Um, so that's that's I've got, I can get up there when I can, um, 
But the one thing I have done is I, if I'm working in Belgium or something like that, I've started, you know, like almost like the scope rods and the, um, yeah. a little bit of the uh, urban type type fishing, um, you know, really, really drilled down on the fishing tackle. Um, you know, and just that's, that's what I've been really enjoying. Just even if it's a 15 pound common out of a Dutch canal or a, you know, a little French park lake, or I, I had this, um, when, when I finished on this call, I've got to go to a party over, uh, back in towards the center of Paris. And, um, there's a little lake where, right where I'm going to, and it's, it, it's an incredible little thing. You can only, they only give you 10 day tickets a day. You can only fish it on Sundays until something like 10 or 11 o'clock. But it's got a 40 pound common drifting around in it. And I've not, I've, I've been around this lake. I've seen the damn thing. I've had a bit of bread crust on its nose a couple of times. Mm. Um, but this lake is like Japanese, uh, bridge, um, you know, we've got a little mini waterfall comes. It's really ornate, but you want to see these fish in there. It's insane. Um, and it's, that's the sort of fishing I'm enjoying at the moment is, oh, is a little bit of crazy, um, rather than the, um, you know, bivy and, uh, spotting out and, you know, wrapping up and all that called carry on. Yeah. It's not, that's not me. Um, I, I <laughs> take my hat off to people who can do it. It's, um, it's going up to linear and fishing braise nose and three on a spot and spotting over the top of it. I, yeah. I've tried it. Um, I can do it, yeah. but it doesn't float my boat. Uh, so it's, um, hey, you know, horses for courses, you know, what floats your boat? Um, so yeah. I, 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 I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. I think, you know, when we, you and I met on Christchurch, that's a lake I would have loved to, um, yeah. in, in high, that's a lake I'd love to have had a, if it was a bit more local or a bit more, um, that was a real bucket list trip. I've always wanted to fish that place. And that's why mm. I, I made a beeline for the place before it went syndicate. Um, but those, those Cotswold water, your Cotswold waters around by you, um, yeah. are gore. I mean, they're glorious waters. They're just the water quality. Just, oh, no. It's, um, but then they're there and some of the waters I'm, I'm fortunate to go and meander around in Europe. That's, you know, these, I bought myself three of those little centuries, um, mm -hmm. little nine footers and just pack yeah. away. I've got an old army camp bed, um, a little aqua atom and it chucks in the boot. It's discreet. And, you know, I could probably do an overnighter now and again. If I'm on the road, anything is a bit of a downside. I've got to figure my way around it. It's a stinky, unhooking mat and stinky landing it. That's not yeah. good in a, in a hot day in a car when I've got to go to another yeah. meeting. So I tried I tried washing it in a hotel bathroom once. That's not cool either because that makes the hotel bathroom stink as well. So um, I need I need to figure that problem out. So I, try, yeah. I tried those. You know, I've tried bin bagging it. That's even worse because, of course, it sweats in that. So, yeah, yeah it's... You still um, need one of those, like, click, click down containers don't you like a, like a massive tupperware thing you know what i mean like filing thing yeah with the handles i don't know if that would do it yeah and then i've i've, I've one thing i have done is i use vercon which is the you know the fisheries hygiene powder liquid they use for dip tanks and whatever and i've noticed yeah. that that can really take the stench out so that's what i have done before is taken a, a trigger spray make up a trigger spray of the vercon hose it down yeah. with the vercon and then bin bag it and it's not so bad but um Jesus, I'm not, yeah, uh, three days in the centre of Paris in your car <laughs> in a hot day. And hot days in Paris is never the best best smelling place in the world anyway. So, um, you know, there's, there's, I, I fished a little park lake in, in the centre of Parma, had got chased off by the police. Um, yeah, it's just a little, there's some lakes near the office in Nuremberg that have got mm. shitloads of lovely carping, but I can't get in the damn club because I'm, it's, um, you've got to do a, uh, a permit to go fishing in hot in Germany and things like that. Um, yeah. You know, so I've got, I've got my eyes on places. It's just a case of yeah. when the opportunity presents grabbing, yeah. grabbing the gear and wait, I'm off. And if it, it you know, disappearing is a little part lake near a, uh, an office I have to go to in Holland, a couple of afternoons on yeah. there, bit of bread flake and things. It's great fun. It's proper real fishing at the end of the day. It's not um, for me. And it's also a bit, of, you know, a nice bit of cheeky silliness as well. It keeps you young. Mm. yeah it's good mate yeah really good um i suppose as well because you're going all these different places it's sort of away from the rat race to a certain extent as well yeah what's incredible though is you know I, just i mean i go back to pre-covid let's say i'd be busting down a motorway in czech republic 
and all of a sudden you you you, you see the blue on the you know your tom tom your gps or whatever you, you see the blue on the side of the motorway we all know that's that little oh there's a lake over there and you sort of you're looking at it ahead of you and then all of a sudden you start doing the craning round you try not to kill yourself because you're obviously driving on the other side of the road on the in a car which is all the steering is all on the other side and um and you look look through and you can see the cuts in the trees and you can see um the swims and then all of a sudden you'll see a tempest or a titan or something like that and you're like oh fucking hell there's another i mean the funniest one the funniest one is you take off at linate airport in milan and there's a really big lake right on there on the as you're coming in or coming going out of linate which is the let's say the urban because two airports in Mil- uh, milan malpensa which is uh, malpensa's bl- bad idea which is up near the swiss right. border um linate is the one it's the urban central uh, main main airport and you're sitting there as you're taking off and there's a lake in the airport grounds that's only for the people that work in the airport. And you can look through the trees and you can see bivvies in the bloody trees sitting there. And that's how big carp angling is nowadays across Europe. Uh, it's, yeah. um, it's, it's, and I'm fortunate enough to, to travel enough to see. Um, it's, and it's actually quite nice because when I go out to the, the office in the US, there's a couple of gravel pits in, in, the, in the area there. And mm. they um i've actually been able to cat they treat the trash fish isn't it is, is the horrible term that they use for carp and um i take a little little short one of those six foot scopes with me and a couple of times i just go down there with a bit of bread flake and and annoy the carp on there and people look at me like a complete weirdo it's great fun so it's, uh, <laughs> sounds mega mate really good yeah. i have to um get some pictures up for like your next trip maybe when you get a chance to go yeah when i get yeah it's um but this is the only downside of post-COVID. Everybody, sort of, since the world's woken up, it's we're we're off like a shot, and yeah. um, and here we go. Um, so. so, if people want to, we we'll wrap up there. For if people want to follow you on Instagram, what's your Instagram handle for your fishing stuff? I keep my fishing one on on student dot grant, um, just a little, just to try and keep a little church and state separate there, because yeah. my my Phil Lowry one is my professional one, so to speak, um, yeah. and. Um, Great. Okay, mate. Brilliant. Right, we'll wrap it there. And obviously, again, just give us the um, web address for the last few books as well, if you can. Yeah, phillowry.net. Um, if you want one, get it where you can. I am going to be, I don't know when you're going to put this out, but I'll ship them as soon as I can when I get back. So, yeah, okay. I'll probably do it like, right now, just so it's out there. So, yeah, I'll do it today. That's Thursday, 30th of June. Mm, cool. I'm okay. not back until the UK yeah. until Monday, so you have to wait. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dom. This That's is awesome. Fun. Yeah, hopefully, okay. see you soon. Yeah, brilliant. Take care, Phil. Cheers. Thanks, bye. Bye.